speakers or three speakers left. Ola Tunander is well known in Norway. He's a, I call him a peace researcher. He, I think he has, prefers another title, but peace researcher is a, a good in my, in my mind. Um, Ola used to work for PRIO, Peace Research Institute of Oslo. Uh, and he is uh, looking at a topic he's going to explain himself because it's, uh, his topic is very interesting. Uh, we are slightly moving away from what we talked about now, but the essence of it is the same. Ola. So, thank you. Uh, just to connect to the former uh, presentation, I, I read one piece from Charles Freeman. Uh, about uh, the situation in Gaza now. And he said that uh, not even the Nazis tried to, I mean, the Nazis tried to hide what, their, what they did, the mass killing. They, when the Red Cross was coming, they, uh, they, they tried to make, you know, fake <laughs> concentration camp or whatever they did. But at least now, is the first time that everything is open. You could see the mass killing every day, and you know what happens, and it's awful. But I'm not going to speak about that. It's, uh, I would connect for, to Jeffrey Sachs, what he said in the beginning, that uh, you know, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, journalism was something different. You had journalists that try to find out what happened. And uh, now it's not possible any longer. It's uh, after 2000 or sometime, you know, to present sensitive matters is very difficult. And uh, I will take an uh, example uh, from uh, Helmut Schmidt, the, the German chancellor. Uh, in late 70s, early 80s, he, his, uh, his uh, Secretary of State for Defense, Andreas von Bülow, and his, uh, uh, he was also Minister of Research and, uh, and Development of Technology and Science. And he was also, after he had been left as a minister, he, he he was responsible in the, in the parliament for the intelligence services in the 80s and the early 90s. And he wrote a couple of books because he realized that the intelligence services in US and Israel and Britain were deeply involved in criminal activity and in terrorism and collaborating with terrorists. And he wrote two books about it, and he was harshly criticized by Der Spiegel. And after that, no, no journalist dared to speak to him. He was, he was persona non grata. I mean, he, he, one journalist, after 10 years, he, so a journalist who made more than 10 documentaries, documentary films for CDF and Arte, he thought he sh it was important to make an interview with him, and he did. And after that, or after his next documentary, he couldn't make any documentaries any longer. So it, and, and then you have to think, how does it function? How is the system functioning? And my conclusion is that it's like a centrifuge. You know, it froze. The, the person who comes closer to something important is thrown away to the periphery. There is no way you could, you know, recover from that, or almost no way. And, uh, so, and the problem is also that the more important you are as a, you know, former minister or former or famous professor or something like that, the, the, the more 
the faster the centrifuge moves. So you are thrown even further away from the center of discussion. You, you cannot do, you, you, you cannot come back any longer, really. And it's, but today something has happened, or you know, in recent, very recent years, during the war in Ukraine, it's no longer about you know, the most sensitive things, what is, you know, the, what the intelligence services are doing and so on, and that you're re revealing what the intelligence services are doing. The problem is that what formerly was mainstream security politics is not possible to speak about. I mean, everyone who knows, you know, something about security politics knows that Ukraine could never win against Russia. Russia has much larger industrial base, much larger population. And if Russia consider the war as an existential war, as they said, I mean, that was clear from what Vladimir Putin said the same day as the, uh, as the invasion took place. He said it was existential for Russia. And in that case, Ukraine could never win. But every journalist, in the large media, said that that what was going to happen. We will have victory, they said. And so it, it's kind of very strange development. And, and when you, you could wonder, why did the US do that? Why did they push for this war? And, uh, and I think that uh, Harald Kuyat, that was mentioned before, the, that uh, was the chairman of NATO military committee, he said that, you know, the point was, and uh, I mean, it's not only him, but, but uh, he is, is more important than I am, so to speak. And, and uh, he said that you had to weaken Russia before you attack China. You, ha you have to, st you, when you start the war with China, you couldn't have a strong Russia because then Russia would support China and, and that would be too dangerous. So, so, I mean, you could say it's stupid, but, but that's, that's the way people are thinking. And, and the media was thinking in terms of a, of a, you know, that Vladimir Putin wanted to reconquer the Soviet bloc or the Russian Empire or something like that. And, uh, and just if you give them, if you give the Ukrainians some more weapons, they will force the, uh, the Russians back. That was the point. And... Uh, but now, I mean, it hasn't been possible to have any other view. I mean, you wouldn't find in Dax Nittarten and, uh, and Dax Ravine, you wouldn't find, which is a Norwegian major media, uh, you wouldn't find anyone diverting from this view. And, uh, and of course, it wouldn't be difficult to find such people, they, but they have not accepted that. But now something has happened in recent weeks because you realize that the spring offensive, the Ukraine spring offensive that became a summer offensive, that became an autumn offensive, did not reconquer any land at all. And, uh, and a couple of weeks ago, uh, the national security advisor in the United States, Jake Sullivan, and Avril Haines, the uh, director of national intelligence, they, they had a presentation for the top people in the Congress at the White House, where they said that uh, in very short time, the Ukrainians won't have more artillery and uh, they won't have uh, air defense systems. And uh, the problem is that that uh, Ukraine uh, or Russia may win in uh, f 
few weeks time or few months time. That was a, that was a quote. So, but that is a problem because then suddenly some US journalists said, you know, we may not be winning. And, and, but what has happened in Norway is that the journalists have said all the time that we are going to win. And just and the, in Germany, for example, only if, if we give the leopard tanks, Ukraine will win. You know, and, and uh, we have put in, or not we here in, the, in the, this meeting, but, but uh, we have put in billions on Norwegian crowns into, into Ukraine weapons. And it has only the role of killing more Ukraine soldiers. Because it's, I mean, in hundreds of thousands now, it's very difficult to know the exact figures. And uh, Douglas MacGregor thinks it's, from his sources, it's 500,000. Some people say it's 400,000 or whatever. But very many Ukraine soldiers are, have been killed. And uh, Charles Freeman, as I mentioned, first uh, as a you know former ambassador and former assistant uh, assistant to the Secretary of Defense, or no, no, assistant Secretary of Defense, to be more precise, he he said that uh, we are fighting to the last Ukrainian, and that he said month, one month after the war started. Everyone should have known at that time that this war will just kill Ukrainian soldiers and possibly all of them because Russia is a bigger country. And then if you l try to look at what happened really, how could, how could you f succeed to get the media to think in these terms? And... Uh, and then you see that uh, what happened was that they spoke about a, a full-scale invasion, Putin's full-scale invasion. That was said by Dmitry Kuleba in the early morning, the 24th of February, exactly two years ago. And, he, and every journalist quoted him. And you know, if you listen to the news in Norway and probably uh, uh, in other countries, they, when they start to speak about Ukraine, they start with the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. You couldn't start, the, to, you couldn't mention the Ukraine or the war in Ukraine without saying the full-scale invasion. And the same is uh, about the unprovoked attack. Where does it come from? Early in the morning, the 24th of February, Boris Johnson said, spoke about the un Putin's unprovoked attack on Ukraine. And then later on in the day, President Biden said, uh, spoke about Russia's unprovoked attack on Ukraine. So it's, and you know, you could say, it's clear that you know if you will success if you will succeed you have to create a truth from the very early hours i mean so called truth i mean a, a hegemonic discourse you could say you you have to create it from the very early hours of the event of the war and that was what was done and it was done you know you could say Kuleba was the day before, or, or, or one day and a half before, he was at the White House. So he's, he, he met uh, President Biden, he met Secret Secretary Austin, and, per and perhaps Blinken also, I don't know. But, uh, but this means they have briefed him about, you know, more or less what to say. And, uh, and, uh, and then, I could skip something because Glenn said something already about the unprovoked attack 
and uh, and Bill Burns and uh, and uh, the the NATO uh, what role of NATO when it comes to uh, Ukraine and the meeting in 2008 that was a and uh, but the whole idea that uh, this would be an unprovoked attack is you know anyone who knows a little bit about security policy and history would say this is just nonsense we know that the russian considered any move into ukraine as a provocation that was clear that was stated very very clearly in us documents and anyway they went in so and the secondly the coup that we spoke about also, that, of course, this was a provocation. And also in the, the, but Russia was, accepted the Minsk agreement, which was a neutral, neutral Ukraine. And special, special possibilities or special treatment for the Russians in the East, and they could, were allowed to speak Russian and so on. But that was not accepted by the West. It was actually, it was, uh, I mean, first you could say 2019, uh, Ukraine decided to, uh, to, in, to add the NATO membership, the attempt to get into NATO in the constitution. I mean, this was a break or breach with the with the Minsk agreement. And the, and the Minsk agreement was, you know, to have a neutral Ukraine. And uh, the, the secretary of the, of the, the security uh, of the, what is, security committee, National Security Committee of, uh, of uh, Ukraine, Danilov, Oleksiy Danilov, he, he said that the Minsk agreement would, would be destructive for the country, or it will, will destroy the country, which means any kind of uh, separate uh, possibilities for separate uh, uh, decisions for the eastern part of the country would be unacceptable. So it's, and, uh, but what the Norwegians, they, they think in terms of, or many, I would say, not the people here, uh, think in terms of, of uh, the US, some kind of Vietnam War that the US would have to back out from the Vietnam War and something like that. And, and if it's too costly, you have to leave the country. And they think that Russia would leave the country. That would never happen. It's they, they, because Russia consider the war as existential. So it's, it's a... But uh, I could read a couple of lines from Vladimir Putin from the day when, he, uh, when uh, Russia went into, in, uh, invaded Ukraine. He said, I have already said that Russia accepted the new year political reality after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. We have been treating all the new post-Soviet states with res respect and we will continue to act this way. We respect and will respect their sovereignty. However, Russia cannot feel safe, develop, and exist while facing a permanent threat directed at us from Ukraine territory. Also, not Ukraine in itself, but the US role in Ukraine. And Putin added, it's not our plan to occupy the Ukraine territory. Yeah, that's what he said. I mean, thousands of times people on the in the daily media here in Norway, they would say that Putin in his speech 
said that he will occupy Ukraine. He didn't say that. But, and then, actually, if we disregard what Putin said in his speech, and what, if we disregard the, you know, his support for neutrality in Ukraine, you could say that what Douglas McGregor said, that this force that Russia entered Ukraine with was very much too small for a kind of occupation. Everyone who knows anything about the rule of thumb for occupying territory says that you, know, that you had to have one soldier for 40 or 50 inhabitants or something like that. You should have, but actually when Russia went into, or Soviet Union went into Czechoslovakia, they, they had a 10 times larger force and then Russia when it went, compared to inhabitants, when they, compared to when they, when they went into Ukraine. So you could say any military expert would say Russia went in with a relatively limited force of army force and very little navy and air force. I mean, U.S. starts with large, every war U.S. starts with uh, bombing of the big cities. And, uh, and Russia didn't. So it's, it's uh, and you could say also, I mean, if you go to the, what has revealed recent w months, you could say, is that, uh, and what's you know, mentioned shortly before also, that the negotiations in March 2022 in Istanbul, the, the advisor for Zelensky, Oleksiy Aristovich, he sec said that it, they were successful. We, we, we succeeded. We all, they opened the bottle of champagne. And, uh, and uh, the head of the negotiation team from the Ukraine side, he, he said that the key demand was a neutrality. But Boris Johnson came and said, we are not going to sign anything, quote. And let's just fight. That was supposedly what, what Boris Johnson said, according to the head of the negotiations. So it's, it's a kind of, I mean, the, it's clear that Russia wanted a neutral Ukraine, but not one single newspaper mentioned it in Norway and in most other countries. So it's, uh, but the problem now, you could say, Russia gave up on the neutral, uh, on trying to have uh, negotiations for neutrality of Ukraine, and they took the, the part of Cherson and Sabritsche, and, uh, and they also, because, because they, they saw that they had to con they had to continue they have to have a new relation and and for forcing ukraine to accept neutrality they or the rest of ukraine what we could say today as what would be rest, what be left over of ukraine because russia will never give up these territories so it it is a then the war will continue, and it may be, as uh, Douglas MacGregor said, that maybe it will Russians will go to to Dnieper, to the river, before the West accepts. I mean, the point is, the longer the war continues, the more Ukrainians will die, and the less territory Ukraine will get. Thank you.